Tech for Seniors, episode 52. This is uh, March the 22nd. We have uh, 100 people in the audience here and a whole bunch more over streaming on our YouTube channel. So I wanted to thank everyone for coming today. It is an uh, honor and a privilege, of course, to have our one year of shows. Wow. Uh, we did 52 consecutive shows. For those of you who are here in the Zoom session with us, uh, the show will, um, will be uh, about an hour long today. And then, of course, we have our question and answer time afterwards. So we'll go about 20 minutes afterwards and try and get uh, all the questions answered. Uh, we also uh, broadcast this on our YouTube channel. And you will, for those of you over on our YouTube channel, you will, um, you'll be, uh, the show will go on for about 50 minutes. And then we, um, we end the show uh, just before the uh, music with, uh, with Ray. And uh, however it is, uh, as you all are aware, we do record this show and it is available on our YouTube channel, uh, usually by uh, the, this afternoon. So uh, all, in fact, <laughs> if you want, you can watch all 52 episodes. So that's, uh, that's uh, pretty cool. Uh, we also, uh, for those of you who have been following us on our Facebook uh, feed, we do have uh, uh, we do have a Facebook um, page now, and we do uh, update that on a regular basis with interesting articles. So thank you all for coming today. Uh, this is uh, an exciting time, and it's sort of an emotional time for Huey and I. Um, we have a big announcement to make. You're probably all here wondering what the big announcement is. Now, I said in the newsletter, it's a, it's a happy announcement because I'm sure many of you are wondering, what is Tech for Senior? Are we going to continue on? Like, what, 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 what are we really planning with this thing? And uh, we had some soul searching uh, this, this, uh, uh, this past few, few weeks, and Huey and I have spent a lot of time talking about this. So the big announcement we have today is everybody, I guess nobody has a drum roll, right? If, yeah, Huey, you can do a bit of a drum roll. The big announcement we have is season two, right? Season two of Tech for Seniors is the big announcement that we have, and we're gonna continue on with the show. Now, you have to remember that one year ago when Huey and I sat down and we talked about this, virtually, of course, um, is we thought we would do this for two or three months and that would be it. You know, we'd get a few people that come and watch us. We had no idea what would happen with the show. And of course, as, uh, as we were talking earlier before the show started today, we have a little staff meeting and, and we were talking about the, the first ones we did weren't that good, you know, really. So I think uh, anyway, so it was, um, but we got better. And as we got better, the show grew. And of course, it's you, the people who are watching the show that are our audience that, that really keeps us going. And it is, um, we don't get paid. It's all a volunteer uh, organization. But it's you, it's, it's the excitement of having 100 people come and listen to us and all the things that you do that makes us keep going. Now, we, are, we do recognize that as, as we move into year two and season two is that um, life changes. Life's going to go back to normal to some degree. Uh, will we have the same reader, the same number of people logging on? Because people's lives are going to sort of get back to normal and people are going to start to travel and move around. So what will happen this following year is a bit of a we don't know. It a lot depends on if, if we get supported by everybody and everybody keeps coming in these great numbers, we'll keep putting on the shows and doing the best we can. Whether it will be a, a, a weekly show or not, um, we don't know. I mean, but we are committed to doing this on a long-term basis, not a short-term basis. So that's the big, the big announcement for everybody today. Um, Huey. Yes. But what have you got any have you got any wise words of wisdom for us? I always do. Uh, actually, though, it's been a great year. We certainly didn't expect it to to last more than a few weeks or a few months at the most. And we've enjoyed doing it every week. It has been uh, uh, I think we've improved as we've gone along the quality of material, uh, uh, the quality of the recordings and uh, and the quality of our audience. We have a great audience. And uh, some of the questions that you guys come up with, especially in the Q&A uh, area, have 
uh, have been some really good questions as well. So I think there's a need for us, and uh, uh, we're going to continue as long as you as long as you support us, and, and if, with just attending and watching, uh, that's all we need. We aren't asking for any money. We would we don't uh, require any subscriptions, and we're glad you're here. Thanks, Yuri. Bob, Bob, any uh, any emotional your, any emotional sort of feelings about life? Well, I was kind of hoping that, you know, one of these days I do something besides just security, but I'm never running out of material. <laughs> Every time I think things are getting better, I wind up with a longer update, and that's not the way life should be. But I also know that over the year, yes, you're right, we've gotten better even though with the snafu this morning, but yes, we've gotten better. I looked at some of the beginning ones. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Well, the snafu this morning is solved by video editing. So you will not see the snafu. When, when this gets published, you won't see the snafu. So uh, that's another thing that I, I've done and I got a lot better is I'm really good at Camtasia now because it's 52 hours of editing just in Camtasia alone. So we can usually fix stuff. So thanks, Bob, for all you do. And thank you for, uh, for, the, uh, for the security. Every week you do the security and, and it doesn't look like the bad guys are going away. So I guess we keep, we just keep going. Um, and let's talk to, um, to Ray. Ray, now you have really, I, I can't tell you how many people write and email me and tell me about how much they enjoy the music segment. And particularly the last couple of weeks, it's been great. So your, any thoughts? Well, uh, listening to you folks, uh, everybody is now proving the axiom, practice makes perfect. The more we do it, the more we understand and maybe correct mistakes. I'm the most fortunate, I think, of the group here. Uh, Bob is you know, saying with his security updates, he uh, is never running out of topics. Well, look at me with songs. I have at least 50 million more to go. <laughs> I guess you're right. I guess you're right. So, so thank you so much for what you do, and and thank you for keeping our toes tapping. We look forward to uh, some great uh, some great music. Uh, so thanks so much. And Dewey, Dewey, um, thank you so much for all you do. Now you are the last person to join the show, and Dewey fit in like a glove. He's uh, he's uh, in fact he's. Uh, you know, he's, he's every week. It's, it's really interesting stuff you're doing. Are you having fun? That is the problem. I'm having too much. Darn <laughs> fun. Anyway, uh, I want to encourage people to, if you, if you have any comments on the stuff I do one way or the other, please let me know through chat. That's a very good way because I always read all the chat and any requests or whatever. But anyway, I, I look at tech for seniors as the best is yet to come. We're doing yes, well. Hopefully. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, Bob, do you want to take it away? Bob, we'll let you take it away. Yes, sir. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending March 19th, 2021. Netflix tests password sharing warning. Some Netflix users received a surprise when they logged on last week. A warning message reminded them that password sharing is forbidden on the platform. This is something of a new stance for the streaming giant, as it has traditionally taken a lenient attitude toward account sharing. With CEO Reed Hastings saying in 2016, Password sharing is something you have to learn to live with. Netflix itself has encouraged users to share accounts. A vast researcher, Louis Carones, commented, in fact, one of the advantages of the most expensive plan is that you can have up to four sessions simultaneously with the same account. That being said, there is an actual need to reinforce security as there is no 
two-factor authentication and approving devices asking for this two-factor authentication will prevent the use of stolen accounts in the future. Perhaps the company has pivoted because Netflix accounts are among the most widely shared. The new Netflix warning message reads, if you don't live with the owner of this account, you need your own account to keep watching. It offers to email or text a verification code to the user and also offers a verify later button. A Netflix rep told Variety that the company has rolled out the warning as a limited test and it is only being run on TV devices. NIC releases report on foreign threats to 2020 U.S. election. The U.S. National Intelligence Council has declassified a report on foreign threats against the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Compiled by the NIC, CIA, FBI, DHS, NSA, and other agencies, the report concludes that there was no physical tampering with any voter machines or ballots. However, the Council did find that both Russia and Iran attempted to influence the election by pushing narratives intended to undermine Americans' confidence in the electoral process. The report also submits that China considered measures that would influence the election, but ultimately decided against using them, as neither candidate's win offered enough benefit to the nation to risk the subterfuge. Tinder will add background check feature. Later this year, dating app Tinder will add a feature that lets users conduct background checks on their prospective dates. Tinder is owned by Match Group, which is also the parent company of Match.com, Plenty of Fish, OkCupid, and Hinge. Match Group was criticized in 2019 when a ProPublica investigation found registered sex offenders on its platform. The background checks will be provided by Garbo, which collects public records and reports of violence or abuse. The checks will not include drug charges or traffic violations. Read more at BBC News. Australia passes new Online Safety Act. The Australian government has agreed to pass the Online Safety Bill 2021 into the country's new Online Safety Act. Despite reservations from tech companies, civil liberties unions, and some government officials, Federal opposition to the bill argues the legislation was too rushed, with no consideration of the possible consequences. The Online Safety Act gives the eSafety Commission the power to order the immediate deletion of any web content if it deemed offensive. The Australian Greens see it as a dangerous first step to normalizing a government-controlled Internet. For more on this story... CZDNet. FaceTime users suffer wave of group call spam. Pranksters are giving FaceTime users a headache with a new trend of spam calls joining group calls. According to the Ars Technica, the perpetrators can call up to 31 numbers at one time, and the prank calls come in during the late hours of the night ringing on and off as many as 20 times in short succession. FaceTime does not offer the option to limit calls to one's address book, so users have little resource except to block each individual number in the group chat. This is not the first FaceTime group chat bug to surface. As last year, a vulnerability was discovered that allowed users to start a group chat with someone even if that person did not accept the call. One notable thing about that bug is that it was discovered by a 14-year-old. Four tips to boost your home Wi-Fi. One, test your internet connection. This is the first thing to do so you know where your computer stands. Go to www.speedtest.net, run the test, and compare it with what your internet provider promised. If there is a great difference, give your ISP a call and confirm you are on the plan that you think you are. 2. Get closer to your Wi-Fi router. 
The distance and walls between your laptop and your router make a big difference. The further away from the router signals you are, the slower your internet speed will be, and the more likely it is that you will experience drops in connection. Move your laptop closer for faster speed. Certain apps can create a Wi-Fi heat map of your home to show you where the strongest signal is. 3. Consider a mesh network. Today, more and more consumers are investing in mesh networks. These consist of a set of Wi-Fi nodes around your home that dynamically work together to create one strong, robust network. Mesh networks provide traffic speed and, when set up properly, eliminate any Wi-Fi dead spots in the home. Research the best mesh networks and choose the one that's right for you. 4. Assess how many apps you have online. With most people working from home and most students performing distance learning, chances are your household's internet is in heavy use. To figure out who or what is hogging the network, the best place to start is your router. Log on to your router and check its settings. That wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Bob. That was great. Uh, just to let everyone know that uh, Bob now is including in his uh, YouTube videos, because these are all playable back uh, on YouTube, a timestamp chapter in the bottom. So you can go right to the section that he, uh, that he uh, is recording. So that's pretty cool. Thanks, Bob. My pleasure. All right, uh, let me just uh, share my screen and we'll see if how this is going to work. Now, what we're going to talk about today, this is my segment, uh, and I'm going to be playing this. Um, this is part two of how to increase your internet speed with uh, modems and routers. And uh, sort of this follows along. You remember last week I played part one. This is uh, part two and sort of follows along a bit about what Bob was talking about. So let's see what I have to say. You should have a dual band router. If you purchased a router in the last five years, then you probably have a dual band router. Now, what do I mean by a dual band? Well, it broadcasts on two different frequencies. It uses a 2.4 gigahertz frequency and a 5 gigahertz frequency. So there's two frequencies that can broadcast your Wi-Fi on. Now, there's no relationship to 5G. When I talk about 5 gigahertz, I'm talking about a frequency, nothing to do with 5G. Now, you need to know how Wi-Fi signals work. If I have a router at my house and you have a router next door at your house and our Wi-Fi signals are broadcasting, there's obviously going to be some collision. The problem that happens is this. If my signal's going out and it's going by your, uh, by your house or there's a signal coming in and the two collide, my signal says to your signal, Oh, excuse me. And your signal says, excuse me. Oh, you go. No, I'll go. Okay, I'll go. So signals are very polite, but this leads to congestion because the more collisions you have between different modems, the slower your systems will get. This becomes a huge problem if with signal strength. If you have a router that you've bought and it's a very powerful router, and you're using it for a big house, let's say a 4,000 square foot house, and then you move into a condo, a place where you have a very tiny area to live, and on that particular floor, maybe your condo floor, you have maybe 10 suites, and they all have routers in them, but if you've brought your bad boy router, as we call it, and bring it into your uh, your condo, then the signal strength is going to blast across the whole floor and all those people. Um, it's going to lead to congestion and it's going to lead to collision amongst these 
radio waves, and this is going to slow everybody's signal down. So that may be an option when you, um, if you live in a populated um, condo or apartment, and all of a sudden you notice a degradation in your signal, it could be someone that's bought a brought a bad boy router up and plugged it in, and it's giving a lot of congestion traffic. So that's one of the problems that you may have. Now let's talk about, uh, there's two signals. There's the 2.4 gigahertz signal. This is the com most commonly used uh, with routers, Internet of Things, uh, hubs, and security cameras. They usually broadcast on the 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, it gets fairly good penetration, so it goes through walls, goes through glass, and certainly even people, right? So this is why it's always been used. This is the original Wi-Fi signal was 2.4 gigahertz. The problem, of course, is that since everybody's broadcasting on that one signal, it can lead with a lot of congestion and slowing of traffic. The second broadcast signal is on the 5 gigahertz. And this should really be your choice when you're choosing between the two, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. You should be you should be broadcasting on or receiving on five gigahertz. And why is that important? Well, there's less problems with congestion, and it also is much faster. Being a higher frequency, it's it actually is a much faster signal. However, the problem with it is is that it doesn't penetrate walls glass and it's usually limited to one room. Now this is a great advantage if you're in a congested area such as a condo. If you have a lot of Wi-Fi around you and you're receiving on your 5 gigahertz signal from your router then that means that you're probably going to not get that much congestion because this signal doesn't go outside your room. So this is the signal you should be using on a dual band router. Now, let's look at the two signals that you'll have coming from your router. Now, your SSD, well, your SSD is a unique name that is associated with your router. Now, you might, it might be Netgear 345 or whatever you've named it. Now, in this example I've given you, you'll see that this is called Home 6595. So if you look on your Wi-Fi settings, you'll see that the arrow, the, the red arrow points to 2.4. Now when you're connected, then you would be connected to the slower 2.4 gigahertz. But also if you look on your network settings uh, for Wi-Fi, you'll also see that the same SSID has a 5 next to it. And this is the same router broadcasting in two different frequencies. One is 2.4 and one is 5. In the example here, the person is connected to the 2.4. To connect to the 5, you would simply uh, move your cursor down and click on the home 6595-5 and then you would be connected to the 5 gigahertz frequency. So what I want you to do is next time you're at your computer look at your Wi-Fi settings, look down the list and I bet you'll find that there's two broadcasting frequencies for your SSID. Have a look. And then let's choose the 5 gigahertz because it's going to be faster. Now, what happens if you don't see a 5 gigahertz? Well, there's a number of reasons for that, but there's primarily three. First of all, you may not have a dual band router. So, possibility. Uh, the second thing is, is that your uh, 5 gigahertz band 5 gigahertz frequency may need to be turned on in your router. Most routers that you purchase come with the 5 gigahertz turned on. Part of the reason I think is that um, most people don't know how to log into their router so that would cause a huge amount of support calls to the um, router makers 
if it wasn't automatically turned on. So most of the time I see with modern routers that you purchase today, the five gigahertz will be turned on. So you should see it. Now, if you have a dual band router and it is turned on and you still don't see the five gigahertz um, signal, then it could be that your laptop is very old and doesn't have the uh, five gigahertz receiver in it. So in the diagram I've shown here, uh, I've just shown you the router settings and usually it's just a toggle switch to turn on the um, five gigahertz if you need to switch it on. Now not to worry, if you have an older laptop and you don't have a five gigahertz receiver in there, you can easily add one very cheaply. And this is a USB dual band adapter. Uh, I, this was $22.95 on Amazon. And you can just plug this uh, into the uh, USB port and it will give you a, you'll be able to receive a five gigahertz signal. These are readily available and not expensive. Now, do all routers broadcast equally? Well, no. Uh, some are more powerful than others, and you can just imagine this particular router and look at all the aerials in it. Amazing. This is a bad boy router. This is uh, a very powerful router, and one that you might consider if you have a very large house. But certainly inconsiderate if you live in a one-bedroom apartment and there's lots of apartments around you. Because if you're going to use this router, then in fact, you're going to be broadcasting a lot of signals and causing a lot of congestion, which again, as we've discussed, is going to slow the system down for everybody. Another reason, by the way, to make sure you don't use Wi-Fi, because if you plug into your, your router, then you'll, uh, this, of course, will not be a problem. Let's talk a little bit about um, Wi-Fi extenders. Uh, we also call these boosters. These are very popular. Many of you always ask me, should I get an extender to help with poor coverage in an area of my house? Now, the Wi-Fi extender extends the range of a Wi-Fi wireless signal from a Wi-Fi router. So it's going to take your existing signal and it's going to extend the, uh, the range of it. But that's with a cost. So it acts like a bridge between your Wi-Fi router and the Wi-Fi device that you want to connect. So if you have a computer uh, in two or three rooms over and you can't connect to it, then what it will do is it will uh, take the signal, it will rebroadcast it, and uh, connect it in the other room, the three rooms over. Uh, so it, it's using your existing network. And it acts sort of like a wireless access point for your devices to connect to. So it actually has a unique SSID. So it's going to... Um, you're going to have your initial router, which has an SSID. It's going to broadcast to this device. This device has, a, it's like a second router. It will receive the signal, and then it will have its own SSID, and then it will broadcast to uh, the next device that you want. Now, there's a cost to this, and here's, in this diagram, I've, uh, I've showed you exactly how this is going to work. Each time you run your signal through an extender or booster, you're going to reduce the speed by 50%. And the reason for that is, is because it is, um, it's the law of physics is that the signal has to come uh, to one device to the other device, and then it's going to be rebroadcast again to the next device. So you're going to find that the signal is uh, will get reduced. So you do not want to use uh, Wi-Fi extenders in combination or things are going to get very slow. Now, this is exactly opposite to mesh routers. An example of a mesh router is above that, and you'll see there's no loss of signal. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Now, one of the things you should do if you have 
poor areas of signal in your house is you might want to consider a power line adapter. We can actually send your Wi-Fi signal down the electrical grid in your house. It actually works on your 110 volt wiring. So in this situation, you'll see that your router is connected to a device that's plugged in to an electrical outlet. Uh, three rooms down where you want to connect your device, you simply plug another device into the electrical outlet and you can either plug that into the computer or it will broadcast a Wi-Fi signal for you. And so you can actually run a network in your house on your existing electrical wiring that you have in all your rooms. The one the one thing that it won't do, though, is if you have a um, circuit breaker panel, it won't cross the circuit breaker panel. So, for example, suppose you had uh, in your house, you had an existing panel and then you maybe had another office in your another building or garage, then it wouldn't be able to go out. There would be another electrical panel with circuit breakers that wouldn't, and it wouldn't cross that. So there are some limitations, but these are commonly used. They're uh, quite inexpensive. As uh, the example I've given you, uh, the one here is about $74.99 for two of them. And this will effectively uh, make it quite easy to get uh, signals to all parts of your house. All right, uh, we're going to stop it there. Uh, the next uh, next week we'll be talking about mesh routers, the uh, ports to plug in in your computer, and also Wi-Fi six, which are really important topics to talk about. And we will be doing that next uh, next week. Now uh, we're going to move on to Dewey and see what Dewey has for us today. Let's let's hear what uh, what we have, what Dewey's uh, got for us. Good morning, friends. I'm Dewey, and my tech talk topic for today is a quick and easy way to create a database. Now, if you've ever thought about it or you'd like to create a database of names and addresses, like for sending out holiday cards, or maybe one that lists the essential information about everyone you know, since of course not everyone has Google or smartphone contact lists, or maybe you've agreed to be the membership secretary for your small club of perhaps 20 or 30 members, or maybe for a large club of several hundred members. Well, anyway, you need to find an easy way to create a database, database that's quick and easy and very easy to keep up. I have an answer if you own a computer with Microsoft Word. It doesn't matter whether uh, the version of Microsoft Word is old and new. Word's awesome capability includes a quick and easy way to create a database. Dewey, you're full of it. Word is for word processing. You got to use Microsoft Excel or maybe Microsoft Access to do a database, don't you know? I'm sorry, my friend, but I disagree. And I'm going to show you why in the next several minutes. To create a database in Microsoft Word, you need to go to the table function. Over the years, I found that very few Word users know how to create a database using this table function. And when I searched YouTube on the topic, I, wasn't able, I was not able to find a single YouTube video that demonstrates what I'm about to show you in the next few minutes. Now, the, the first step in creating a database is to decide which elements of member information you need at the minimum. Typically, perhaps five to seven information elements are needed, and rarely more than eight or nine, maybe 10. You know, if you need 102 elements, enjoy Microsoft Excel is all I have to say. For the club I recently joined, I have six information categories uh, for the vertical columns and seven rows for our current membership. And it's very important that I have a header row that shows the name of the information categories. Well, let's first start, first insert a table by going to the ribbon and choosing insert. So I'll put my cursor here on insert and open it up. And right there is table. We can click on that and notice very easy. We can, we can just say line out the six columns and uh, eight rows, you know, seven members plus a header. But you know, that's not really a very good way to do it. And I'm gonna show you why. 
I think it's a lot better to insert a table. Here you put in the number of uh, columns and rows manually. And there are defaults, but you change them easily. And the most important thing is right here, it says auto fit behavior. The default is fixed column width, which may be helpful occasionally, but not usually. If you're doing the same number of characters or numbers or something, fine. But auto fit to contents is really a great way to do it. Now, instead of clicking OK, I'm going to click Cancel because I already have this pre-format. So here we go. First thing is, there's the name of my club. You always want to give your documents a name. Now, tech nerds, well, we're pretty techy. We don't spell very well. Okay, going on. Uh, you know, you're going to have different versions of this as you add members or lose members or people's information change. So every time you make a change, you have, should have a way of making a new version. Here's what I suggest. I just call the versions, versions by their date. This is was created on March 4th, okay? Next, uh, of course, we put in our basic uh, grid for the six columns. It doesn't look very good right now. Pretty skinny, but there are six columns. Well, the next thing we're going to do is start adding our header names. And the first one I'm going to put in is the last name. Usually people like to have databases that start with the last name. Occasionally, you have databases with the first name. Now we'll put the first name in and the other ones, home address, city, state, zip. To talk about this for a minute, uh, probably not many of you have seen combining city, state, zip. But if you don't need to differentiate, you know, have separate columns for the different elements, put them all together in one. It saves space, makes it easier. Then, of course, you should have a phone number. I always like to put the word contact because I think that most people will realize they want my cell phone number for easy contact. And lastly, we want email. Now, you notice right away the, the, the various categories already are auto-fitting. They're just as wide as they need to be. Well, we're going to enter our first name of my good old Miss Bobby Drew. My, this is my first fictional friend, uh, and uh, he lives on Nantucket Drive in Janesville, Wisconsin, and there's his email address. So uh, we've got him there. And the next one is uh, Nick Greeno, and we'll just go down the line. And you notice there they all are, the, the seven members. I'm the last one. I got six fictional friends and myself, and last time I looked, I wasn't terribly fictional. Well, anyway... Uh, that's not bad looking at, uh, it's kind of scrunched up. Let's do something about it. I think before we do that, you know, I noticed on the left, the names aren't alphabetized. Can you imagine making up a database list without alphabetization? You got to have it. Microsoft Word provides it. All you do is go over here. Well, first of all, you need to select, you need to select the column that you want to uh, want to alphabetize, and you go over right here. This is on the home home ribbon. You go over here to A's. You see that A Z with the downward arrow. You click on that, and you get this dialog box. Sort by last name. Sort by text. Other options are numbers. Let's see. We're going to sort by membership number, phone number, whatever, or, or date, whatever. Uh, that's. Anyway, we, we have it on the default of text. I click OK, and look at what happened. Now, we have every, the alphabetical list of last names, and their information went along with them. To prove it, remember my buddy Robert Drew here on the, the second line of members, Nantucket Drive, Janesville, Wisconsin. You all remember that. So, so we now have our list alphabetized. It still kind of looks a little scrunchy to me, if you, because you know, white space is really valuable, and I like white space. So what I usually do is add a little bit, and you can go uh, do that by going to uh, to layout, and here is spacing. Now, if we right, we have spacing before or after. That means before or after each particular cell. Again, I'm going to, in this case, since I'm I'm going to want to affect the entire database. I'm going to, I got that, I'm going to try it again. Okay, I am going to just 
I've got the whole database selected because I want everything to have space. And so we'll go six points above and six points below and take a look at that. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it? Now that's kind of appealing. It's pretty easy to, to differentiate, to read information and differentiate information. You know, if you want to add some color, that's no problem either. You know, you could, let's say you want to put your header line in color and, uh, and you, you can do that very easily. I think we're going to go to the home page here and I'm going to do a fill in color. Um, I think, which one is it? It's right. That's the font color. So this must, this must be it. And we'll pick a, we'll pick a nice light blue color right here. Oh, that's kind of heavy. We better pick something else. How about let's pick, this is softer. Okay, so there, well, we've got a little color. There are other ways that you can shade every other uh, every other role and different things you can do, but I'm kind of running out of time. So I'm gonna say, well, that's my tech talk story for today. And I'm really sticking with this one, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Thanks for watching, stay safe and have a great day. Well, <clears throat> well done, well done. <clears throat> That was really good. Thanks so much, Dewey. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> so, I'd be curious uh, as to what other people think of it, if you don't mind. <laughs> I, well, I think you're going to have lots of comments about that. That's absolutely, uh, that's absolutely great. Um, that's super duper. Uh, now, Huey, are you are you still with us? I I'm trying. <laughs> what do you got for us today? Well, let's go see. And minimize this. Does your computer have Bluetooth built in? I'm Huey Poplock. Today we're going to talk about how to check if your desktop or laptop running Windows, Mac OS, Linux, or Chrome OS has Bluetooth support. Whether you have a desktop or a laptop, you might wonder if your computer has Bluetooth support. Perhaps you want to take advantage of Bluetooth connections, but don't want to buy an adapter if your computer already has it built in. I'm going to show you how to find out if your Windows PC, Mac, or Chromebook has Bluetooth built in and what you can do if it doesn't. How to check for built-in Bluetooth on Windows 10. On Windows, you can check a few different places to see if your machine has Bluetooth. The easiest one is in the settings menu, which you can access using the Win key plus the I key or by clicking the gear icon on the start menu. We'll start with the gear menu. Once it's open, go to devices. Once you do that, you want to go to Bluetooth and other devices. If you see the Bluetooth slider in this menu, your Windows PC is Bluetooth equipped. There's another place you can check for Bluetooth availability in Windows 10. That's the device manager. To access it, you can right click the start button, which we're going to do in a second, or you can hit the win key plus X. We're going to right click on the start button. We're going to come up to device manager and click on it. As soon as we do that, if you'll see Bluetooth here in the list of devices under your computer name, you'll see a Bluetooth entry if your laptop or desktop has Bluetooth. If you don't see this, then your computer doesn't have Bluetooth built in. And you'll see that there are a lot of entries there. How to check for built-in Bluetooth on a Mac. The majority of modern Mac models, both iMacs and MacBooks, have Bluetooth built in. So as long as you're using a current machine, there's a good chance you have Bluetooth. It's easy to confirm this, though. If you see the Bluetooth icon 
in your Mac's menu bar at the top of your screen, then your Mac is equipped with Bluetooth. In case you don't see this, click the Apple menu in the top left, choose System Preferences, and look for the Bluetooth entry in this menu. If you open the Bluetooth menu and see options for turning on Bluetooth and connecting devices, your Mac has Bluetooth built in. How to check for built-in Bluetooth on Linux. If you're on Linux, open a terminal and run the following command to check for Bluetooth. And it's there on the screen. If this returns some information about hardware, then your computer most likely has Bluetooth. Otherwise, you probably don't have Bluetooth built in. It's a bit more difficult to tell on Linux since the kernel doesn't support some forms of Bluetooth. Try running a search for Bluetooth on your system if you're still not sure. How to check for Bluetooth on a Chromebook. Let's watch this short clip. Go down to the right corner and click. And if you see the Bluetooth logo there, then your system has Bluetooth. Let's see that a little bit larger. Notice the Bluetooth. And then when you click it, it will scan for devices. It takes a few minutes to search. And in this case, it found my headset, which is, a, which is labeled Y-12. Versions of Bluetooth. Here is a list of the versions. And this is a bit too techy for me, but I wanted to show you uh, this chart, which is Bluetooth 5.0, 5.1, and 5.2 that are all available and the differences. Now, which version of Bluetooth is on my device or on your device? To see which Bluetooth version is on your PC, we'll have to go to the Device Manager. We went to it earlier, but we're going to go to it to, to a different way by typing in device. And as soon as we get to the word device, it picks it up. We click it and we open up the Device Manager. We showed you this earlier. Click the arrow next to Bluetooth to expand it. And then we want to select the Bluetooth radio listing. Yours might simply be listed as a wireless device. On mine, it says Intel Wireless Bluetooth. I'm going to right mouse click it and click on Properties. When I do, I want to go to the Advanced and I'm going to look at the firmware version which is LMP 10.256. The LMP or Link Manager Protocol listing in the firmware or firmware version area tells us that the LMP version that we, that we have on our device. And then we have to find our version number in the table to map the LMP version to its Bluetooth core specification number. That's the highest core specifications your device fully supports. Let's take a look at what that means. On my computer, the LMP was 10. So if we look on our chart, we'll see LMP 10 is the Bluetooth core specification 5.1. On your Chromebook, you can check the Bluetooth version by doing this. And there's a series of instructions and you'll get a screen similar to what we have. Let's take a look at what that means. You open up the Crush, the Chrome OS developer shell. You type in BT underscore console, and then you type in version. And in this case, it came back at version 5.54. To get out of this, you just type in the word exit. It gets you out of this, and then you close the window. Now, on my Apple iPad Air, this is what I found. And in that case, I am using Bluetooth 4.0. 
And to get to it, I went into my settings. When I went into my settings, I found the model number and then I had to go to a website to be able to get that information. I was able to find the model number and then I searched for the model number. For my iPhone, I typed in iPhone and then the model number and a Bluetooth, a Bluetooth version and it brought back the results that I found and this is running Bluetooth 5.0 and I have an iPhone 8 and this is my iPhone 8 information that has my model number. So here are the features and characteristics of Bluetooth. You can have a lot of different Bluetooth devices. Now, on your computer, on your PC, after checking the above steps, you might have found your computer doesn't have Bluetooth built in. If this is the case, the easiest way to add Bluetooth to your computer is by purchasing a dongle. These adapters are cheap and plug into a USB port to provide Bluetooth support. In most cases, you don't have to configure them. You just plug them in and you can use Bluetooth easily. You can use a Bluetooth speaker. There are some great Bluetooth speakers out there. So this has been Do You Have Bluetooth? I'm Huey Poplock. Thanks for joining us. Great. <clears throat> now, great, now great. What, I, what, what I didn't do is talk about the devices that are Bluetooth and how many you can use and so on. I'm going to do that in a future video. Part two. Yep. Part two. Uh, Bob, Bob, you've got something for us. Let me unmute. Let me share my screen. And Ray, you'll be up next. This is a Whoop. short segment, and then uh, uh, you're up. I'm I I popped out. My internet had gone down, so I'm not a host anymore. Co-host. Oh, oh, really? Yep. So you I have to make have to make me a. You're sneaking out and back in. Yeah, I didn't intend to. Believe me. Okay, let's make this nice and big for everybody to see. Most of you already know that when you're watching a video in Chrome, it's quite easy to turn on subtitles and closed captions, but you have to click a button once you start your video in order to accomplish that. So start the play and then you have to hit the button. And you have to do that for every video you watch. Some people depend on subtitles and closed captioning, and it's something that ought to be on all the time. And there's an easy way to make some adjustments, so that is exactly what will happen. Let me go through showing you the changes that have to be made so that anytime you watch a video in Chrome, subtitles will automatically be turned on. Start by Clicking on the three dot menu, once that's done, go down to settings. When you go to settings, go to advanced. Next, go to accessibility. And in accessibility, live captions. Automatically create captions for English audio and video. Make sure you turn this on. Now that this is turned on, we can go back to the video itself. I'll do a refresh. Uh, let me go back to the beginning. You'll notice that captions also appear well below the actual video. It makes it much easier to see the video. Captions don't interfere at all with the video itself. It's how you can make the captions appear anytime you start a video in Chrome. Stay safe, be free. I hope this helps. Thank you, Bob. That was great. Mm -hmm. This is the time of the show that we have to say goodbye to our live streaming over on YouTube. So for those people who are 
Uh, we still have a whole bunch over there on the live stream. So we're going to say goodbye to you now uh, as we move into our music segment. Uh, and if you, um, for those live streamers, if you want to watch the recorded video of this, it'll be up on our YouTube channel later on today. And we'll be seeing all you people next, uh, same time, same place next week. Uh, Ray, are you ready to roll? I think so. Let me give it a try here. All I'll right. Share, share my screen. Okay, today the word of the day is busking. Now, I first heard the word busking used by Art Garfunkel during an interview when he was relating how he, Paul Simon, and Paul's girlfriend at the time, a woman named Kathy, had earned money in the early 60s when they were all living in England. Now, trivia, if you're familiar with the Sound of Silence LP by Simon and Garfunkel, there's a song titled Kathy's Song. Well, it was named and or actually inspired by this young lady. Anyway, basically, they would sing on the sidewalks and in public parks, hoping that people walking by would donate some cash for their musical efforts. Today, the word translates to street singers, and that's still very popular in large urban cities around the world. Now, this leads to the question today, can modern buskers make enough money to survive in these trying and often turbulent times? Well, case in point is Ali Sherlock, who was born April 7th, 2005, and is definitely not like most young teenage girls about to turn sweet 16. According to Wikipedia, and yes, Ali has her own page. She is an Irish singer, songwriter, guitarist, busker, and has been actively singing since 2016 when she left primary school and began homeschooling. Parental involvement is here as her father records and uploads all his daughter's YouTube videos. Let's look at her accomplishments. They include her own website and her own YouTube channel, and she's appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Additionally, she is on Instagram and Facebook, and her music can be streamed on Spotify and Apple Music. Ali has posted online a total of 549, count them, 549 music videos. The one you're about to see where she sings Unchained Melody as a duet with Kuan Durkin, this was posted on October 1, 2020. That's less than six months ago. Yet, she already has almost 21 million views with over 16,000 comments. So even in the times of a global pandemic, the use of various social media platforms and other modern technology can successfully overcome these challenges. The youth of the world can be proud. Oh, that's pretty impressive. Not even Great. 16 years old yet, and look what she's accomplished. Wow, 21 million views. I can just imagine that on a, I mean, oh, wow, that's crazy. Eh? Less than six months. Oh my gosh, yes. Well, listen, it's, uh, it's three minutes past the hour now. Guess what? We did another show today. A I want to thank year. everyone for coming. Again, it's our, this is our 52nd show. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to move now. Uh, for those of you who want to leave, that's fine. We'll be back the same time, same place with the same gang uh, next, next week. Uh, and we will be moving now into our question and answer period uh, for, the next, uh, for the next 20 minutes. Um, now, it, for most of you, uh, you, can, you can certainly, it's best if you, it's hard for us to see so many people on the screen. So if you, um, on the bottom and reactions, if you click on the reactions, you can raise your hand. And what happens is when you raise your hand, um, it, uh, it pulls you up onto the top by the, by, so I can see you and acknowledge you, okay? And if you can't do that, well then scream, yell, raise your hand, do something which you, you know, to try to get our attention. Uh, so we have two people. Murray, what do you have for us today? Okay, well, I was just, it was just a question. I did put it in the, private chat to you, but I wanted to, if you would uh, tell us, you mentioned the name of the software that you use to do your video editing. I was wondering if you could tell me what that is and maybe provide the link in the chat. Oh, that. sure. The, the software I use is called Camtasia uh, and it's a video editing software. Uh, it's just spelled Camtasia, C-A-M-T, I don't know, Camtasia. It's very, very popular. It's used, um, uh, it's used 
it's it's commonly used. Now I will tell you that it is um, it is it, you have to buy it. it. It's it's a it's a purchased video editing software. There are a lot of video editing software softwares out there that are free. Um, I chose Camtasia because Chris and Jim use that. Where is Chris? You know they use it. They got me going on it. But it is it is um, it is. It is good software. I, mean, I don't. It's probably not the best, but they have a very good training program, and a lot of a lot of people use it. So there's a lot of a lot of how-to videos, and and they offer a whole series of training programs associated with it. So, uh, but it's not cheap. It's I think it was about three hundred bucks to buy it. So it's but there. So there are lots of lots of free vet, video editing software, though. Yeah, I've been using Pinnacle Studio. Uh, yeah, I really liked it when that was owned by Pinnacle. It got it went downhill with it. I mean, as far as service, customer service tech support, it went downhill when um, uh, I forget whether it's one of the big uh, name companies bought them, and then Corel bought them, and then it really right. went downhill. Right. Which is disappointing since Corel is a Canadian company. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Helen, oh, thanks, Murray. Helen, um, now ask, ask, let me answer your second your monitor question. Um, can you just refresh me? You you have multiple monitors on a, on a PC, is it? Yes, it is. So, and what's the problem with the multiple multiple monitors on the PC? Okay, let me let me. Okay, I I have two monitors, and I can see both of them. I can I um, I can see the uh, background and the uh, the the desktop on both of them. I can choose. Um, my computer can see them both. I can choose. To work on either monitor, um, uh, or I can choose to duplicate my work so both things show up on both monitors. Right. I can also click on something called this extend, and the only change there seems to be that the background might change. Uh, you know, the the background uh, photo that I use, so it might not be the same on either modem or either monitor. But I can't. I can only work on one monitor at a time. I can't. I haven't been able to figure out how to move my my cursor over to the other monitor, and that's, that's the, my question. That's the extend feature, okay? So yes. the extend feature extends extends your desktop onto the other monitor. So you'll it'll be like one big monitor if you <clears> put, <throat> click the extend option. I click the extend, and uh, I still, for instance, right now. I have it on extend and I can see the zoom program on my chosen monitor, but the other one is just sitting there um, with the background. Yeah, if you, right. if you grab, if you grab the cursor, if you grab the, the window, sort of as the, you know, the, the, the window that you have up on your one monitor. And if you just mm -hmm. extend it, just drag it over. Okay. To the right. are, are you and, talking about in settings? No, 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 no. no. When right you now. Look at your, when you look at monitor number one, okay, okay, and you have a window up, let's say you're in Chrome and you've got a window up in Chrome, okay, and maybe okay. it's a full screen. If you take the right side of that window, okay, take the right and just drag it over, you'll see okay. it extends onto your second monitor. Okay, the right side. Yeah. Okay. Or whatever I just side did your that. monitor. Okay. I just did that with yeah. Zoom meeting. And it should extend over onto it the It does next. not. You can't, my, my, you can't my, drag it. I, you can't drag the no, window. Uh, no, I can't. I uh, right click. No right just, click. No left click. No, no, no. Just drag. No, no, the, no just right left click. click. Either one. No, not right, right click. click. And can you can you grab the top of the window? Hold down your left mouse key and then okay, drag I'm it over the window. Okay, I'm does, moving. Does the window move? I move the window and it goes it should off. Be, should be it able to drag it all the, the way over the, the other one. It, okay, I could move it till it goes off this screen. And it go on to the other one. Nope. Push it in oh. reverse, do it the other side. Yes, what I was okay. just going to suggest. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there it went. There, okay. I can see you. Okay. <laughs> Tell her to switch to monitors left and right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, of, one of them is two and the other one is one and you've got them. I got them the opposite backwards. side. Yeah. Okay, so. yeah. yeah. What happened was when I, okay. So I switched it over, now you're there. 
but I'm still on here. But I, how do I get so that I could use my my uh, um, cursor? Oh, I've got oh, your picture there. Um, Huey, open you're another, sitting there open another program. Okay, Let's I have say another a word, program a word open. or notepad or something. I've got an, I've got a word open. Uh, drag and it over to the other my, window. I can what? Drag it over to the other window and then start using it. Okay, I can I can do anything I want on monitor one with my cursor. And you okay. can move your cursor. Now remember, you're going to have to move your cursor to the left and not to the right, even though the monitor is on the right. Move the okay. cursor over to the left, and that will go I, to the other okay. screen. Okay. Now I just I moved um, Word over to the left. My cursor. Yeah, okay, sure. I see. I have to. Uh, I have to switch I, I the have monitors. To stretch my arm. <laughs> no, switch your switch your monitors. Make one, two, and two one. Yeah. And then I it'll work. Then right is right, and left is left. Right now, your monitors are reversed. Right, are, yeah, I understand be. that. Okay, but by moving, okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Greg, Good. Greg, are you going to give us an update on Starlink? <clears throat> That's correct. Uh, I just ran a speed check, and I'm uh, 157 for my internet, and my upload speed is 27. Very good. So, so how is your experience being this week? Are you happy? Yeah, very happy with it. Uh, this week here, we had 50 to 75 mile an hour winds and blew part of my fence down, but my TV monitor up on the uh, uh, house uh, didn't even wiggle at all. We never even lost anything. No, it's it's really good service. They sent me a, uh, an email and asked me to evaluate it. And I just said that while we're buffering uh, in our movies with Hallmark. So my question now is if I buy an extender, will it hook up to the Wi-Fi from Spacelink and uh, I'll put it close to the TV and that should eliminate the buffering? Uh, well, let me, let me, so first of all, those of you who don't know, uh, Greg, uh, Greg is actually a real live Starlink member. He's, he's got Starlink up. He's got the satellite. He's, he's a paid up, honest to goodness, for sure, real guy who has Starlink up and running. So he gives us these updates each week to let us, uh, let us know how things are going. Um, Greg, I'm not sure I want to use an extender because it is going to cut your speed in half. Um, I will talk to you about that. I'll call you and I'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, I think you'd be better. There's some other things that we could possibly. I think your mesh at. would be better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't like the extender idea. I just got to know a little bit more about your setup, but I'll give you a call and we'll talk about that. Okay. Okay. I just ran a speed check again and it's 212. Yeah. It's a good service. Yeah. It's great. All right. Thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, Chris. Chris Rosinski. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, just um, a request for Huey. Uh, next week, when you do the thing about Bluetooth, I'd like him to talk about how to make speakers that little speakers and other devices that are um, uh, a different Bluetooth number, backward, backward or forward compatible, or anyway, will they work on different um, Bluetooth uh, numbers? You know, that, that, right. that's a request. Uh, then the other question for 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 Ron is since. Since the world is mobile, although Ron and I have this thing about, I'm not sure that he, he likes all the mobile stuff. The question is, um, uh, what what does the cell phone hotspot produce in terms of frequencies, and can a cell phone hotspot uh, signal be extended? Uh, sure. I mean, a cell phone could be extended. I mean, I don't think that's a great way to go about it because you could put an extender on a hotspot. It's just a Wi-Fi signal, and then you could extend it. But remember, you're going to cut your speed down by half each time you do that. So you have to decide, you know, how you're, how you're going to, how you're going to do that. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that's the best, the best way to do that. Uh, but you, but for sure you can, uh, you can broadcast out uh, from a, from a hotspot and use an extender. What, do you know what frequency that's going at? Uh, it would depend on your, uh, uh, let's see, you know, your phone would be connected. Uh, well, it depends on what you're connecting your phone to, right? 
Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and the reason I ask that question is, well, we're, we're often in locations where the signal's bad, so we have to use a, a Wi-Fi ample, not, excuse me, a cell phone amplifier that right. amplifies all of it, which means that in order to use those mobile ones, you have to put the phone directly on the external antenna. So that right. becomes a fixed location. Now, if you want to go in, in a distance, then it's different. But there are a lot of people out there with, with uh, RVers and Saturn millions of us, and uh, so well, that's a pertinent question for us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jim Glass, you have a question. Unmute yourself. Thank you. The most commonly used Zoom term, unmute. Yeah, unmute. <laughs> uh, actually, this is more for Huey. Uh, I bought one of those NUC by Intel uh, computers. And uh, it was advertised that it could run up to three monitors. However, I can only find one HDMI connection. The others is a uh, Thunderbolt, a C, or uh, the USB 3. My other monitors are uh, HDMI or VGA. And I was wondering how I can uh, connect another monitor to that uh, computer. Uh, I'm running two. I have one uh, HDMI, and then I also have, uh, I think it's the Thunderbolt 2 HDMI uh, Adapters. adapter, and that allows me to have the second screen. Uh, there's there USB is. to HDMI. So uh, there's, there's a lot of ways you, you have to do it with an adapter. There are adapters available on the market that plug into your USB-C and act like a, the old fashioned docking station that right. have a multitude of outputs available. Right. And some of those would be HDMI and possibly even going back to VGA. So I've seen it in, on Amazon. There are, sorry, I'm not looking for it now. There are a multitude of docking ports that you would take off your USB-C. My laptop doesn't have C, so I'm at a little bit of a dis, uh, disadvantage for that. Right. So, uh, so C Jim, if I could just answer that, goal? Jim, if I could just answer that question, it depends on the graphics card that you have in that nook. And it depends on how many monitors the graphics card will, 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 um, will allow. Most graphic cards will allow two monitors, all right? Now, if you want to get more and you, you want to get more monitors, then uh, like Noel said, or Joel said, you need to, um, you need to extend that. And the, the unit I have is made by Pluggables, P-L-U-G-A-B-L-E, it's Pluggable, is the, is the uh, docking, it's a docking port that I have. And this is a three monitor, you can buy them. Jim, what you have to do is look when you buy the Pluggable device, is it'll tell you, is this a two monitor, three monitor, four monitor, five monitors, however many monitors, it'll have a graphics card in there that will, that will allow you to plug those monitors in. And then how you plug them into your computer, just plug them in. You can plug them into a USB. Uh, if you do choose a USB port, make sure you choose a USB three, if that's what you've got on your machine or a Thunderbolt is great, but you have to make sure it's a Thunderbolt dockable, you know, that it all works on Thunderbolt. So, so look at the specs on that, but it really comes down to the graphics card. What I had problems on my laptop with is I wanted to run two external monitors. Well, the graphics card on my ThinkPad, of course, has the graphics. It, of course, there's the monitor on the, the ThinkPad, and then there's the one external monitor I could have, but I don't want to do that. I want to have two big screens plugged to my ThinkPad, and that's why I bought the pluggable uh, docking station, okay? They're not that expensive. Pluggable is a great company. Susan, Susan, you had a, a question for us. You're muted. Yes. No. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I got the time wrong. I thought your meeting was at 10 o'clock, <laughs> not nine o'clock. I... Well, you know what? We tape this and you can actually watch it. And in fact, you can watch all 52 episodes. If you want, I'll send you the link. Oh. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is, have you done a, a one that I can check back on, on explaining how to share material on Zoom? 
because uh, my daughter has, my granddaughter has been sent home from school uh, because they have to quarantine for two weeks because somebody has the virus. And uh, I was going to help her, but I'm not sure how to um, uh, share document. How, how, where can I find the documents? Is there a way of explaining it? How to, sure. how to share? Sure. You're, we're really talking about two different things. Uh, the first thing would be you want to, what, what Zoom does is you can share your screen. Right. So right. that's you've seen how we do that today. Yes. And we did that in our Zoom meeting and we share a screen. Zoom really isn't meant to be a document sharing, you know, uh, where you actually share the documents. That's not really the function of Zoom. It's more to share, share the the um, share the, the 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 screen or the, the meeting. Right. So if you wanted to share the documents, then there are different different routes. Does, here we, I don't, uh, can you in, share documents? Yeah, yes, there you is. can. In, it has to be set up, but you if you can share documents within it, Zoom. Oh, in okay. the chat, in the chat function, you'll see at the bottom you have a file sharing okay. option. Okay. So I could go to a website that I want would want to use and and put it on there, and she would be able to see it. Not if necessarily. They have to have it turned on. I don't think we have. And that's not file on. sharing. That's just sharing your screen. If you have the website open, you share your screen, right. and the right. other person will sh will see what you see on your monitor. Oh, okay. okay? So I can that's share just my screen. There is, there is a way of doing that. Yes. Thing. Okay. Screen, great. That's sharing your screen. Okay. There and is I can get that see. by pressing the when it says share something up the top. And then I'll go to my I'll go to the website and then she'll see it. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. There okay. is a way to share files uh, through uh, Zoom as well. It has to be turned on, and I don't believe we have it turned on to even do it through this meeting, but it's a way, I believe it's through Dropbox and a couple other ways you can move files back and forth as okay. well. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Irving. Uh, so, I have my hand go. up too, don't forget. What? You got your hand up? Yeah. It does. <laughs> All right. Let's get Irving first. Let's ask okay, Irving. That's and then fine. We'll, yeah. You're muted, Irving. Irving, there you go. There we go. Hope you can hear me. Yeah. I was one of the unlucky ones who didn't make it this morning for the for the beginning of the Zoom meeting. So when the uh, session was uh, was over um, on uh, the uh, on YouTube. I went back uh, to try and get in, and I was fortunate. I guess enough, a few people left, and it let me in. Sorry, we're All having right. we're yeah, having, we're having trouble hearing you. Yeah, we're having audio problems with you, Irving. Irving, we're yeah. having audio problems with you and we can't hear you. It's probably an internet thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, we can't, we couldn't, we didn't get what you said, Irving. Good Starlink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you have a very low, slow internet to internet connection. We can't really connect with you. Okay, another time. Okay, Carl, Carl, you have a question hear him just fine yeah thank thanks uh, uh i have a um, media center in up in my my family room and i'm watching the uh, uh this program on my laptop and on my large screen tv through a hdmi direct connection uh one of the media centers is an older uh sony and basically my uh, cable goes into the media center and then i can you know, put other things in there, uh, like my stereo system and uh, what other HDMI devices, and I can select them with a Sony remote control. What it doesn't have, which new ones have, is Bluetooth transmit. And I've looked online for, I'd like to take the output from the media center, the common output, and run it to a Bluetooth transmitter because I've got a lot of Bluetooth speakers I'd like to take outside and or somewhere else in the house and listen to the program when I'm not able to sit in front of the TV. Who knows or have purchased uh, 
Bluetooth transmitters would take the audio out and give me a Bluetooth transmit so I could use it in my Bluetooth speakers. Do you have a USB input? A USB on, input on, your, on, the, on the media center? Yes. Uh, I have to go look. I don't want to do it right now, but I don't think so. I know I have the RCA outputs. They're all RCA uh, outputs. So there's You'd nothing else to, to go from RCA to Bluetooth? You would have to do a search. Yeah. I don't know of any. USB, either. yes. RCA. Okay, so all right. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Carl, let me give, give you some advice. My, my thoughts on Bluetooth are it's like black magic. Like uh, who knows how it works when it does work. So if you are going to purchase something, make sure you can get your money back if you buy the device, right? Good you point. Know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Marcia? Marcia? Yes, I, I thought it's for me, it's Marcia, but it's a 50 oh, sorry, 50 chance. <laughs> um, I wanted to compliment Dewey on his presentation for the table in Word. And I just wanted to give everybody an, uh, a reason why you might not want to combine address, city, state, and zip code. Um, because when you're setting it up, it's so much easier to put the information in the way you're going to be using it. And for example, in my community, we just delivered donuts to a whole bunch of people. And because we could uh, sort by sort and or filter by street, that was very easy to do to organize it. Or if you just wanted to send something to people in Canada, you could sort and filter um, that way in your table. And if it's taking up too much room, you might you change the orientation of the page from portrait to landscape. And that gives you more real estate to have your table laid out. And uh, kudos to, to Dewey, I really liked it. If I may comment very quickly, you're, you're correct. I tried to indicate that if you need to, to separate city, state, zip, especially the zip, do it. I, I had to do that one time. And by the way, my layout was on uh, was on landscape. You don't want to do it on portrait. You don't have enough space. Thank you. And listen, everyone. Um, Dewey's presentation was excellent. It was really. It's always good, but Dewey, that was really a very very good presentation. I'm going to twist Dewey's arm and see if he'll let me post it to our YouTube channel, and we'll make it an actual YouTube video that you can rewatch and use it. Uh, I'm going to twist his arm and see if he'll let me do that. Um, but he usually does what I tell him. So that's pretty good. So I think, I think I'll be able to get that by him and we'll put it up as an actual uh, YouTube video that you can replay. And I will just comment that, uh, by the way, that also works perfectly well with LibreOffice. It works the same way. Yeah. So you can do the same thing with LibreOffice, which is completely free and cross-platform. Thanks very much. I was wondering about that. Thank you. Okay. So do I have your permission to do that, Dewey? We'll talk about it because I may want to redo it if you're going to do it. Okay, all right. And and the last word of the day before we leave is Huey. Huey, I left you till till the last so you can have the last word. Yeah, I just wanted to clear up something that was on learning Chromebooks the uh, uh, last week. Uh, there was some discussion on the latest version of the Chrome OS. Oh, right. And uh, we all were talking about OS 89, version 89. And Bob said, well, he's on 90, 90 is the latest. Well, Bob forgot to tell us that he's a beta tester. Right. So he's always one version ahead of us, but the actual uh, current version of Chrome OS is version 89, 89. which is yep. also the, the current version of the Chrome browser. Uh, and he is using 90. So he's always ahead of us. But we know that about Bob anyway. He's always that's like I am I with win that's like I am with Windows because I'm on their what do you call it, their insider program. Huey, I have little time left, so I have to be ahead. That's right. <laughs> All right, everyone. Listen, it's uh, 9 30, or sorry, it's uh, 10 30 here. Um uh, it is uh or in the end of a different time zone, it'll all be something different. But anyway, thanks everyone for coming to our 52nd uh version of Tech for Seniors. Uh, thank you, Huey, for coming. We'll see you next week, of course, right? Absolutely. We'll be here. And thanks, Bob, for all you do. And thanks again. Thanks for having me. I and, enjoy and, it. 
and Ray and Ray, thanks so much again. Uh, uh, that was great. And and Dewey, uh, wow, you you hit a home run today. Wow, that was pretty impressive. Well, frankly, uh, you remember there was somebody I was having a little problem with as far as getting databases for a particular club, and it's dedicated to that person. I don't remember who was that person. Have you seen it? Have you looked at yourself in a mirror? Lately? <laughs> 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 All right. We'll see everybody next week. Have thank a good you. week. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye.